everyone, my name is Angela Cusin and I own a business called Music Strong. What I do is specifically strength training for musicians. I help musicians prevent and overcome playing related injury. And as you may or may not know, up to 90% of musicians are injured eventually as a direct result of playing an instrument. This can be combated in the studio, but too often as music educators, we are afraid to you know, tell our students where to go because if we're not in the weight room and we don't know good form and we don't know who's a good trainer and who's not, and we don't want to steer our students wrong. And I understand that. Um, I have been injured four times as a direct result of playing my instrument. I'm a flute player. I've had two separate injuries as a result of playing the flute. First one was at Interlock and Arts Camp as a 16 year old. I ended up with uh, tendonitis in my wrist and uh, I also experienced massage for the first time and how wonderful that was but when I got home the doctor gave me some physical therapy and some exercises and then just said if it doesn't get better we'll give you a cortisone shot and uh, other than that you should stop playing. I was 16. I had honor band auditions coming up soon. I was like uh, that's not an option. I just got done with an arts camp because I love what I do. Stop playing at 16? Are you serious? But that is all too often the answer that we get. And I've been injured three separate times, uh, well, three more times. And that is the exact answer I got. I got the answer of, you should stop playing when I tore a muscle right here behind my shoulder blade in graduate school for flute performance. The doctor said you should quit playing. And I said, that's not an answer. And then I have had thoracic outlet syndrome over the last year that I've been dealing with. And the chiropractor I was talking to, which I love chiropractors, and he deals with musicians on a regular basis, but his advice besides adjusting me was to rest. As a hypermobile individual, I have too much range of motion in my joints. That is probably the worst advice I could have gotten over the last year. The situation has gotten worse. It started to get better and then it hit a plateau and I've gotten worse because if I don't lift and if I don't strengthen my joints, if I don't keep my body strong and healthy, my situation is going to get worse and it has. The defining moment that helped me create this business is when I was cramming for an audition on Piccolo. For the president's own, I was going to take an audition and realized I didn't know all the repertoire that I needed to know. And so I, I was like, well, I love piccolo, but I've never actually studied the orchestral rep. I need to, I need to get in on this. So I went from zero hours a day to up to four hours a day, daily. As you can imagine, that's a terrible idea. I was like, oh, I'm strong and healthy. I can do it. No, I couldn't. I got to the point where I couldn't put my arms down because it's not about the weight of the instrument. It's about the posture, right? So you're playing like this, flute you're playing like this. Previous, last injury, playing alto flute like this. And when it gets heavy, you can see how that would change things. So with piccolo, I'm in this position and you know when your students get really into what they're doing and they're passionate, they love what they're doing, you come forward and you get into your own space, right? And this was me, I was just, just super focused and then I, I couldn't put my arms down. I was getting super painful spasms in my back. And I went to the doctor and I said, what is going on? He said, you actually have an imbalance between here and here, a muscle imbalance. And what's going on is that you have a knot right here and it, it's a trigger point. And it's so severe that usually I would give somebody a shot, a cortisone shot right in the middle of that trigger point. It would calm it down, but it's right over your heart and that would probably kill you. I don't think you want that. So I'm gonna give you a cream, kind of like a steroid cream. You should just slather that on, rest, and then you should stop playing. And I said enough, this is not the answer. What other profession do you tell people, well, you should just quit doing what you're doing? Do you do that in baseball? No, you send them to an athletic trainer, you send them to a physical therapist, you send them off to rehab, whatever injury is created by what they do, and then you put them back out on the field. What other profession is, well, you should just stop what you're doing. What? That's not the answer, okay? So when up to 90% of musicians experience playing related pain on a continual or reoccurring basis, 
saying you should just quit playing is a cop out. It is not the correct answer. And so that's why I decided to found Music Strong because I love exercise. I like strength training and I realized that a lot of people do yoga, they do stretching and they do running and cardiovascular, but there was this missing component. There's this missing component of strength training. So if you think about the trifecta of, you have exercise, you have, you have, well, it's not trifecta, but you know, if you have, if you have a tight muscle and all you do is stretch it, but you don't strengthen the weak muscle, you're just perpetuating the cycle of injury because you're not actually helping the problem. So that's what I do. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about some things that you can do in your studio without a background of exercise, without worrying about what you have to know as a certified uh, personal trainer or an athletic trainer or a professional who needs to know that kind of thing. You don't have to know any of this. Now, that being said, I did write a book this last year called The Musician's Essential Exercises. And that book does tell you the basics you need to know as a musician when it comes to exercises. Things like basic form, how to brace, how to use your feet, how to hinge from your hips, how to create stability in your spine. And then the basic exercises that you need to know as a musician to stay strong and healthy. And you can incorporate those into any workout you want, whether it's beach body or CrossFit or yoga or you want to use it by itself. That's totally fine. You can do all of that. But today, what we're going to talk about, you should have gotten this handout. I'm talking about teaching safe strength training in the studio. I really wish I could be with you there live and in person. I could take your questions. Please feel free to reach out to me at Angela at Music Strong or on Facebook at Music Strong or Instagram at Music Strong Fitness. I would love to know what you, what, what you need help with. So what I'm going to tell you about are the basics that you need to know as an educator that you can tell your students on how to help them help themselves, what signs they can recognize as issues, okay? So the three most common muscle injuries and or complaints of pain, I see this constantly. We hear about neck pain, we hear about wrist pain, and we hear about shoulder pain. Now, the funny thing is, uh, what you hear when you say shoulder, shoulder could mean like this whole upper quadrant of your body. So what are we really talking about? When we're talking about shoulder, we are talking about the shoulder girdle. So we have the humerus, which inserts right here, and we've got the subacromial space. Not to get all <laughs> anatomical here, but you have all these different blood vessels. You have muscles that insert over here on the arm from the pec majors, pec minor. You have all these different blood vessels and nerves and things that come through this space. A lot of times what happens, like you were talking about what we were talking about with my piccolo, when you come up here, you end up hunching. Whether you're a, a, a piccolo player, or a, a clarinet, oboe, we have a lot of things where we go forward. We call this forward head posture and upper crossed syndrome, if you ever hear these terms. So the head comes forward. Have you seen anybody like this? Your ears should actually come over your shoulders. That's where you should be staying. But if you're not, what you get is this kind of business. And then you hunch forward. And that's obviously an exaggerated posture. But in this instance, if you have that while you're playing an instrument, you get the shoulders rounding forward, you get the head jutting forward, and you're playing, and then you're, 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 you're moving, but you're moving within that scope of, of um, compensation. So what we want to do is we want to correct that. So to be general, the muscles on the front side of the body tend to be tight. The muscles on the back side of the body tend to be weak. So also to remember, the site of pain is not necessarily the source of pain. So if you get a student coming to you saying, I have pain behind my shoulder blade, how many people have heard that? How many people have experienced that, right? So if you get a student who comes to you with that complaint, what you should tell them is, okay, you should actually look at their posture. Are they coming forward this way? Are they coming forward this way? Do their shoulders round? Should they hunch at all while they play? And have them play for a few minutes because if they're just playing, they're very cognizant of you watching them. But once they get into it, then you notice they're not paying attention to themselves as much, right? So that's where you need to be. So we're gonna watch them in that space and if they are coming forward, whether they're here, here, 
here, here, here. Most instruments are played in the front of the body. Even timpani, even uh, percussion instruments, all of those are all played in the front of the body. So the back body gets neglected. And if they're talking about these muscles being tight and weak, or being painful, most likely they're tight and weak. Why are they tight? They're trying to create some stability back here, but they're being pulled forward. So we have to strengthen those muscles. So some of the things that we need to talk about, let's go through this, through this uh, real quick. Wrist pain. This is a huge one, and you hear these terms thrown around a lot. Carpal tunnel syndrome. Let me reassure you, most people do not have carpal tunnel syndrome. It's thrown around as a catch-all, but people don't really know what it is. Carpal tunnel syndrome refers to the carpal tunnel, which is right here. If you look, if you Google what the carpal tunnel is, it's right here. And so the, the tunnel right in here between the two bones has a whole lot of blood vessels, some tendons, some nerves, some all kinds of things. And if those tendons here swell, they compress the tunnel, which causes numbness and tingling in the hand and pain. So the good news is most of the time, from the people that I have interviewed, you know, from ART practitioners to doctors, most of the people that I have interviewed say they have never actually seen a true case of carpal tunnel syndrome. It does happen. And sometimes you do need surgery. Most of the time you do not. Most of the time, the issue is right here in the forearm. So what happens is the forearm muscles get really tight. Those muscles here in the forearms turn into tendons down here. The tendons swell. When the swelling happens, it compresses the carpal tunnel, creating this issue. So what can you do? Well, we can relax these forearm muscles. There's a couple different ways that we can do it, okay? Number one, if you're gonna see, uh, I'm talking about the different types of pain. We have overly tight forearms and biceps also, biceps here, depending on how you're holding. So, to be simplistic about it, there are three different things that you need to do in the studio. Your students need to do. You have to relax the tight muscles, and then you need to stretch them, and then you need to strengthen the weak muscles. So, when it comes to carpal tunnel, let's deal with it. So, if you have access to something here called an arm aid, looks just like this. And this can be swapped out for all kinds of different attachments. You've got, this is an arm aid. If you enter code music strong, you'll get 10% off and free shipping. They usually deal with rock climbers, but I contacted them and said, hey, have you ever had musicians contact you about uh, forearm pain? And they went, no. I'm like, well, you should. Musicians use your forearms all the time. So you have all of these different types of attachments as well. We've got a rubber, we've got oops, rubber, we've got plastic, and we've got foam. So depending on how tight your forearms are, these can be swapped out. So I've got this big one right here. What you do is you put this, they just, by the way, came out with a new version. And if you use the new version, it's gonna be much more compact. Um, this is great for keeping in the studio. Use this before you play. So then I'm gonna show you how. So what you do, say you're sitting down, I'm gonna put this on my leg. You would wrap it around your leg, just like a, like a uh, seatbelt, okay? Then you're gonna put your arm through. You're gonna push your arm through and you're gonna go back and forth looking for those tender points, okay? Ideally, I'd be sitting, I'm not sitting at the moment, but you're looking for those tender points. So, I'm gonna tell you where my tender points are, and you can also swivel this so it gets to the opposite side, just depending on where your tender points are. Uh, depending on the instrument you play, either here, most of the time here, and sometimes down in here. So when you find a tender point, and if you don't have one of these, that's fine, you can use a lacrosse ball, when you put that lacrosse ball between you and the floor, it's not optimal, it's kind of a pain, which is why I like this. Get one for your studio and just let it hang out in the studio or in the practice rooms or wherever. I honestly think all music studios should have these because they're just amazing for, for giving you forearm mobility back that you don't even know that you lost, right? But if you don't have that, you can use a lacrosse ball. You can put a couple of them in a sock. Um, the reason I don't like tennis balls because they have fuzz and they tend to move and they tend to slide more than they tend to roll and you want 
this ball to roll. So a lacrosse ball also doesn't have a lot of give. So if you use a racquetball, it also tends to be kind of squishy. And you want something like this lacrosse ball doesn't have any give to it, and that's what you want. You don't want any give, okay? So whether you have the lacrosse ball, and I'm gonna move this out so it's got a little bit more range of motion. So as you can see, go wider or shorter, okay? So you put it where you need to, and obviously I would be sitting down, which I'm not. I just want to show you how it works. You're going to put that arm through there, looking for tender points, okay? Oh, right there. Okay, a lot of times you're going to find them right up here, like I mentioned, sometimes down in here, occasionally over here. So I'm going to find that one spot on the forearms, oof, whether you're using an arm aid or you're using a, a percussive device or you're using... When I say percussive device, I don't mean like percussion. I mean like a massage gun type of thing. This is a jaku. There's also something called a hypervolt. And there's all kinds of different versions of these. They're really great to use. Uh, I don't know anybody who has tried it and does it wrong. So what, whatever implement you are using, you want to find that most tender spot. You're going to hold it. So like right here, I've got a spot. Ooh, I feel that down in my fingers, okay? So you're going to hold. And then I want you to bring your fingers towards you. So basically, you're finding that tender spot and you're stretching through the motion. If it's too much for you or your student, that's totally fine. Just hold until it relaxes, okay? So it may or may not completely relax, especially if this has been going on for a long time. It's all right, I want you to hold 30 seconds or so, then move on to the next spot. You might have several tender spots and that's fine but you want to hold that on the most tender spot. Come back to the other ones later. You can also use this on your triceps, your biceps. You can even use it on your lower legs. So that's why I like this. It's got a lot of... So another option, if you're going to use the lacrosse ball, use it on your chest. You can tell your students to do this. So you've got three trigger points that are the most tender for musicians. Uh, basically, so if you find your collarbone here, you find your sternum, you're going to go hmm, about three fingers over and three fingers down. Right in here, you've got some spots. Right below, oh, right there. Feel it. I feel it. You of course can't feel it, but I feel it rolling right here. Okay, then you've got some spots down in here in your pec minor. You're going to take this ball, pretend you are your own massage therapist. Take your lacrosse ball. I'm going to show you. Take your lacrosse ball. You're going to put it, pretend this is my opposite side, but find those tender spots again. You're going to put that ball between you and the wall. Take this arm, put it behind you, pull your shoulder down, and roll back and forth until you find that, oh, right there, that tender spot, okay? You're not going to roll all the way down here. You're going to keep it up top, close to your clavicle and down by your armpit, okay? Oof. You find that spot, you're gonna hold it for up to 30 seconds until the pain goes down. Now, the thing with this area is that the pain might not go down. On a one to 10 pain scale, you don't ever wanna go above a seven. You want this pain, wherever it is, to come down to a one or a two. This area is one of those areas it might not actually feel better. It will feel better when you're done, but the pain level might not go down, and that's okay. Speaking to that, if you have pain right here between your shoulder blades. Those muscles tend to be tight and weak, but it doesn't mean you can't use this to calm them down, okay? So you never roll over a joint and you never roll over a bone. So here is my spine, here is my shoulder blade. I'm going to roll right in between those two. You're gonna cross your arms in front of you. Why? Because you're separating the scapula away from the spine, right? You're going to roll, oh, so many spots. <laughs> roll up and down looking for the most tender spot. It, again, may, there's one right there. They like to hang out right at the base, the basis, the, uh, the edge of the scapula. They like to hang out up here. You might even find them in the teres major minor region, region right here. But this area right here, it just feels good, right? Find the most tender spot hang out on it. It, again, may or may not completely relax. And we'll switch other sides so you're evened out. So, two different reasons. 
This one's overactive. We're using this to calm it down and get it to release, to relax. This is weak and tight. So we're using this to calm it down, but then we're gonna strengthen it. Okay, so this is just one of the most common areas. We've got chest and forearms are really some of the most common areas. So chest pain, we just relaxed here. Now we're gonna, we're gonna do a stretch. So once you've released the muscle, muscle, you want to stretch it. This is not a passive stretch. You might've seen this in physical therapy at some point where they go like this in the doorway. Mm -mm. I want you to try to squeeze your shoulder blade back, okay? So squeeze your shoulder blade. You're gonna put your arm at 90 degrees in the doorway right here. If you don't feel anything when you do the stretch, come up a little higher, that will get pec minor. Both of these muscles serve to bring your arms inward and downward, which is where we play our instruments a lot of the time. Flute players, you're probably gonna have tighter left arm. Uh, heart players, you're probably gonna have a tighter left arm. Trumpet, tighter right arm. You're just gonna have to try to figure that out with, based on which arm is more in front than the other. Do this on both sides, you'll figure it out pretty quick. So you're gonna put your arm at 90 degrees in the door, squeeze your shoulder blade down, and twist out. So a passive stretch would be this, and you're just holding. Mm -mm. We're gonna squeeze. So you're trying to activate what's on the opposite side of the shoulder. So we're trying to stretch, uh, activate what's over what we're on the opposite, opposite side of stretching. We're stretching this, we're activating this. So you're gonna squeeze down, twist. If you don't feel anything, come up a little higher, squeeze and twist, and hold that for 30 seconds, okay? 30 seconds is the time that you need for your stretch reflex to calm down. The older you get, might be a minute or two, but for your students, 20, 30 seconds will be all they need. You might feel a little blood flow in here, come out nice and easy, don't run out of that position, okay? Next one, we're gonna be anterior delt and bicep. Why? Because we spend so much time with our arms in front of our bodies and flexed. They need some stretching backwards, so this is how you do it. Take your palm, put your palm down. So thumb side towards the door or towards the um, whatever you got here, but palm goes down. Straighten that arm behind you. So we went from here to here. You're going to straighten that, put the thumb against the door and twist away. Oof. If you can't bring your arm all the way up, that's fine. Bring it down this way. You'll notice my arm is this way. I'm not like this. I'm not like this. I am palm towards the ground. And it's really important because otherwise we'll get the stretch here. So 30 seconds, okay? So that has to do with upper back shoulder pain. Uh, I started with wrist pain, I got a little um, sidetracked. So we're gonna go back to wrist pain. So once you have stretched the forearm muscles here, we relax them, then we need to stretch them, okay? So how we're gonna stretch the forearms, you can do this with any of your students as long as they don't have injury. If they do, clear it with their doctor first. What you're gonna do, you've seen these before, and you do not push. Oh my gosh, you do not push. And if they don't have the range of motion they need, or if you don't have it, that's fine. You don't have to do them on the, on the, on the floor, or on a table, or on a desk. You can do this up against the wall, it's totally fine. So your arm will be this way, okay? No pressure, what you're gonna do, whether your arm is against the wall or against the floor, you're gonna put your wrist directly below your shoulder, okay? We're gonna go this way, palms up towards you, gradually get into that position. Notice my elbows are straight, wrist is directly below the shoulders, okay? Bring your fingertips and your thumb together, and then try, are your elbows still straight? And then try to bring your knuckles off the ground. You should not be able to, but what happens is when you try to bring your knuckles up, that activates this so this can effectively stretch. It's called Sherrington's Law. You cannot stretch and activate two different muscle, opposing muscle forces at the same time. You have to do one or the other. So this way, touch the fingers, try to lift the knuckles. Now, if you're this way, you can do it. If you're this way, you can do it directly underneath, okay? Whether you're on the wall or on the floor. Now, come out of that nice and easy. 10, 20 seconds, do it twice. Second one is for here. Splay your fingertips wide. Bring them directly 
pointing directly towards your body. So if you can only get here, that's fine. Don't try to force it. You're eventually gonna work your way down so your elbows are straight and your fingertips are pointing directly towards you. Fingers splayed wide, okay? Then try to lift your fingertips. Now if I lean forward, I can do that. That's cheating, no cheating. So try to lift your fingertips without cheating. You shouldn't be able to. That will engage here so you can get a better stretch here. Again, 20 or 30 seconds. So, moving on. The third area, so we have wrist, shoulder, and neck. So, neck pain can be felt usually in the back. And when I say back, I mean the back of the neck. So this area is where things hurt. So many times things are tight here. Why? Remember that forward head posture we were talking about. We're going this way. This is compressed, this is stretched. We need to bring the body back into alignment. The ears should stay over the shoulders, okay? Again, these are specific things that you can teach your students without having to know anything about uh, personal training or strength training. It's sort of basic body awareness things that you can watch when they are done playing. If you have to adopt a certain posture while playing, that's fine. But then bring them back into that body awareness of, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. Squeeze those shoulder blades back and down. Chuck that chin. Bring your body back into alignment, okay? So we're going to go through that. I know I got a little ahead of myself. But uh, neck pain. So um, especially flute players, so I'm a flute player, so I'm a, little, I'm a little biased here. But think about your asymmetrical instruments, whether you're violin or viola. Uh, harp, actually, because harp brings right arm forward, left arm this way. Flute, you have the left arm in front, the right arm to the side. Violin, viola, this way, this way. So we have one, lots of asymmetrical instruments, guitar as well. So think about that. When we're coming with neck pain, pay attention to your student. Is their head forward or is their head to the side, to the other side? Do they jut their head forward to one side or the other? Real quick, this is an excellent book if you have neck issues. I got it on Amazon for a few dollars. It's very basic and it will tell, it will tell you some great things if you need to know it. But the very basics that you need to know when it comes to your music students, you have to know three key muscles. The SCM, sternocleidomastoid, goes from the clavicle here to right below the ear, turns your head from side to side. Uh, flute players? Hmm. Violin players? Yeah. Turns your head and flexes in one direction or another. You have the scalenes right here. They're supposed to help you breathe, but when we are tight and tense, they tend to get very tight and tense as well. And then they're doing a secondary job. Instead of a secondary job, they're doing a primary job. We'll get to that in a second. And then we have the upper traps and the levator scapula. The levators go right up behind here, behind the shoulder blade and up. The upper traps are your shrug muscles and the two work together. So I'm gonna tell you how you can address those on your students. Now, caveat. If your students have ever been in a car accident or have had whiplash or a history of neck issues, any of that, be very, very gentle. This is a delicate area and I, I give you all of these with a caveat of they are not appropriate for everyone. Some people might, it looks like they need them, but then they're, they're not gonna feel good doing these. Other people will think they're the best things in the world. So I'm gonna give them to you use them and then try them. And if they don't feel good to a student, just don't do them, it's totally fine, okay? So what we wanna do is, again, we're gonna release, we're gonna stretch, and we're gonna activate. So to release, we're gonna release the SCM first. You're gonna switch to the side, where we find it right here to here. I want you to take it between your finger, your thumb, and the side of your index finger. Literally, you can pinch this thing. This might be easier to do laying down, but you can do it standing up as well. So you're gonna go from the bottom all the way to the top. Oh, right there. You might feel something called referred pain. I'm going all the way up. If this is too much to do this, you can do it this way. Back, so it's not like you're just pressing inwards. 
you're pressing up and back, okay? Tracing along that line. Like I felt something right here, so, right, oh, right there. I feel that here in my sinuses. That's called referred pain. So if you've ever had a massage therapist press on something and it feels good in a, oh, so good, it hurts kind of way, but then you also feel something in another area of your body, that's called referred pain. That's a good thing. It means you're on the right spot. So right here, there it is. Do not hold your breath. Do not lock your knees. Keep everything nice and loose and hold. On a one to 10 pain scale, you should never go above a seven. 10 being, oh my gosh, I think my arm's being amputated. One being, what are we doing? So it's kind of subjective. So you're, the longer you hold these trigger points, they should go down, whether that point is here, here, here. There's a whole bunch of them, right? So nice deep breaths. Let those shoulders sink. Hey, there it goes. It calmed down. Now I barely feel it anymore. I did start to feel it in my fingers and down my arm and in my nose. And the longer I held it, it didn't, I didn't feel it anymore. So now that that's done, I relaxed the SCM. Now I'm going to stretch. Put your left arm behind you. because This is my left side. Pull your shoulder down to the ground. Look straight ahead. Bring your arm. Uh, you're going to bring your right arm pull your right ear towards your right shoulder. So you're trying to create as much space here as you can. That is gonna stretch your upper trap, which we haven't gotten to. And then look up and to the right. And that, you might have to finagle around to find the right angle, but you'll feel a stretch here in the SCM. Hold that, pull down, hold 20, 30 seconds, as long as it feels good. If it doesn't feel good, get out of there. There's a reason it doesn't feel good. You might have neck instability or ligament damage or whatever, especially if you've been in a car accident. But most students will be able to tolerate this fairly well, okay? If they can't tolerate it, that's fine. They don't need it. They can still press on those muscles because the neck wants to try to create stability. And if you, these are over tight, we can still create that stability through strength training without having to do the stretch. And if you have a student with hypermobility, also be very careful. Okay, so we stretch to SCM. Here's how you stretch over traps. Look straight ahead, pull the shoulder down, straight to this side. You should feel that right here. Levators, you're gonna look down towards your opposite foot, okay? If any of these feel really good and you want a little extra pull, what you're gonna do, so say I'm stretching SCM here, and I've got that nice stretch here. I'm pushing right over my, barely, right over my eyebrow. So, pulling down, pushing back, neck, legs are soft, knees are soft. What I'm gonna do is gonna ever so gently push against my fingers right here, three, two, one, relax. And every time we do that, it should go a little farther, okay? It's called PNF stretching, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, if you want the whole thing. So, you can do that on any of these stretches, okay? So, that's for neck. So, we've done neck stretches, we've done wrist stretches, Upper back stretches we have done. So you've also got lower back pain, which tends to happen if you sit for a long time. And now we're all zooming and we're on the, look, we're online right now. Are you sitting down? Does your low back hurt? Do you find knee pain, hip pain, ankle pain? Because we sit so long. So you need more core strength. We need more lower body activation and mobility. So uh, what can happen is the glutes are inhibited. Your butt muscles tend to not work because the hip flexors in front tend to be overactive. Hamstrings, hamstrings are stretched and weak. So um, what I have here, uh, something that you can observe. So if you look at your student from the side, what do you see? Do you see this, the eccentric, uh, uh, eccentric and uh, over-exaggerated low back arch? Are the knees locked? Are they in a normal posture? Or are they tucked backwards and they have a straight line all three, the, the overextended and the tucked under are not optimal and they can create issues. Look at your, look at your student, how they stand. Does your student stand with their feet like this? Do they stand like this? If you ask them to sit, do their knees do this? If they do, this is an indicator of poor weakness. They've got nothing here. So your body's gonna create strength by bringing things closer together. So if they have good strength in their core, and we're not talking about six pack muscles, we're talking about deep core stuff, the TVA, transverse abdominis. So when they sit back into their chair, can they keep their feet straight? 
Can they keep their knees in line? If not, it means they've got some underlying core weakness. When they squat, do they bend forward? Do their, there's a whole bunch of things we could go through. So, um, let's see, uh, non-firing glutes and stuff. Okay, so, <laughs> there's a whole lot we can go through, so I only have 15 minutes. So I apologize for the crash course in this. I got a lot of courses on my website and on YouTube on instrument-specific workouts and how to do those. I really hope you will contact me or take advantage of those because I go into way more depth than we can do crash course here. However, these are some things that you can do in the studio without having to have any knowledge. Let me get off of this for just a second. So we're on the back page. We just talked about all the things on the front. Now we're on the back page. Let me talk about form real quick. So the basics of strength training form, this is in the lower right quadrant of that, um, uh, well, I don't know what you call this. It's here. The basics of a strength training form. You want your spine in neutral. And why is strength training important for music students again? Because if you only stretch what's tight and you don't strengthen what's weak, you're just gonna continue the cycle of, of dysfunction and injury. You have to bring the body back in balance. Yoga is amazing, cardiovascular activities, like running are amazing, stretching is wonderful. But again, if you only stretch what's tight and you don't strengthen what's weak, you're not gonna get any better and your students won't get any better. They'll feel better for a little bit, but they, the, the, the cycle of injury will perpetuate and it could get worse. So these are some things that you can do. I'm gonna go through the basics of strength training form and a few different things that I don't think I have on here yet. I'm about to change this. So some things that you can do without any equipment. You can do these as a pre-practice routine in a lesson. Teach them to your students as a warm-up routine, okay? So um, strength training form, whether they, if they love to go to the gym and they're going to the, the health center and all that, that's awesome. Please do it. These are the things that I wish I had known. Um, I would have avoided my second injury if I had known this. Number one, the, the spine wants to be in neutral. How do you do that? You have to brace it. So when you have a, a think like if you've ever had a knee injury, have you ever had to wear a knee brace or an ankle brace? Sure, why? Because it's unstable. So what we want is the body to create its own stability. How does it do that? It does that by this. Number one, what would you do if I was gonna come up and punch you? What did you just do? You went, oh goodness, right? But also, what happened right here? If you put your fingers from your ribs to your pelvis, you've got a muscle here called the TDA, the transverse abdominis. When it pulls in, what do you feel? <gasps> you feel very strong. You feel very stable. From the side, it's like this. If, I, if, I, if I'm going to pull in, it's not a crunch. It's not a coming forward. It's a, oh, goodness. Now I'm braced. I'm strong. My whole area right here, Lumbar spine is very strong now. It's very braced and solid. Second thing, you want your thoracic spine, this part of your spine, to also be braced together. So what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? You're gonna roll your shoulder blades back and down. So give me a shoulder roll. We come forward, we come up, we come back, we come down. Back and down is where you need to be. So brace, like someone's gonna punch you. You're gonna brace and hold. Also, do not lock your knees ever. I know we talk about that in marching band, but when you try to brace, if you've never done it before, a lot of you will try to do that by locking your knees. Look what happens to my low back. Unlock your knees. Lock your knees. Unlock your knees. Brace. You cannot brace and lock your knees at the same time. Okay? So what I want you to do, roll your shoulder blades back and down. You'll feel like you're sticking your chest out, but you're squeezing right here in between your shoulder blades and you're bracing. Now your whole spine is just locked and loaded, super strong, right? Okay, so hold that. That's number two. Number three, let's talk about hinging from the hip joint. Why is that important? If any of you have ever taken Feldenkrais or uh, Alexander Technique or body mapping, you know where the hip joint of the body is. It's not, it's not right here where the hip bones are. It's where the hip joint is. So I want you to push those. So find the spot where your legs meet your body, right? 
this spot right here. This is your hip bone, your pelvis. This is your hip joint. So if I push into that joint, if I push hard enough, my butt's gonna go back, right? Do my knees bend? No, they're not straight, but they're not gonna bend either. You're not bending them, you're pushing back. That, my friends, is a hinge. You'll feel all the weight on your heels. Which brings me to the fourth, fourth point. As you look down, are your feet straight? You have one foot that's out like this, you have both feet like that. What do you see? Your feet should go straight. If anybody ever says that walking like this is natural, no, it's not. It's actually an indicator of core weakness, and you probably have low back pain that's coming your way if it hasn't already come that way. So, because when you squat, when you go to sit down, you're like this, look at that. Right? If I bring my feet straight, it's totally different. You'll feel it differently here, okay? I'm not gonna teach you about how to squat, but if you've done Alexander Technique, you know the monkey pose, where you're this way? So, you want all that weight on your heels. The difference here is you're gonna brace your spine up here, brace your spine here, hinge, then when you sit, you're hinging here, your knees aren't going forward. Everything is moving to the hips, which are the prime mover, not your knees. Your knees are a secondary mover. So many times they get to become a prime mover. So that's how we avoid it. So the four points of strength training form, you do this for every exercise you do. Roll your shoulders back and down, brace your abs, keep your feet straight and hinge from the hips. Whether you're doing a row or a press, or a squat, or a deadlift, or a lunge, or whatever it is. All of those things. Those are the basics of strength training form that you need. So, oh gosh, we have so much. I don't have time to get into um, all the SMR different things. So SMR is self-myofascial release. We talked about it with a lacrosse ball. Um, you can also use a foam roller, okay? If you happen to have a foam roller in your studio, here is one thing for the thoracic spine, the upper back. If you have a student that tends to hunch forward a lot, this will feel really good to them, okay? Let me see if there's anything else I need. Referring out, who should you refer to? Those are all right on. So, here we go. We're gonna put this right at the base of the shoulder blades. Never, ever roll your low back. This is not, your low back is not meant for that kind of pressure. I don't care who you see seen doing it, please don't do it, okay? So, what you're gonna do is put this at the base of your shoulder blades, looks like this from the side. Let your head rest in your hands. Bring up, go back and forth. Notice I'm only going about halfway down my spine, back and forth. Then place your butt on the ground. Lean backwards. That should feel amazing, okay? Do that either before or after you stretch here, okay? Another exercise you can do to create some mobility after you've done this. We call these open books or thread, well, we're just gonna call them open books. Whether you use a foam roller or not, we'll show you without. Put your hands together. You're gonna to try to get your opposite, oh, this is good. <laughs> try to get your opposite shoulder to touch the floor. This is especially important for musicians who play an asymmetrical instrument, okay? Back and forth. Notice I'm not letting my hips go back. Keep your hips forward, okay? If you can't get there, that's fine. Keep working at it, because you will get there. Now, I have one Strength training move, that is what you need more than anything with no equipment. The one exercise you need more than anything is a row. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a second because I have time. But, this is called a scarecrow. There's a, there's a trifecta of different ways to do this. You can do a cobra, a prone T, or a scarecrow, I'll show you all three. And each one has to do with going against gravity as a progression or a regression. Number one, 
prone to, I'm um, sorry, a cobra. And you would do this after you roll, after you stretch, then you're gonna activate, then you're gonna play, okay? And these are things that your students can do. If they love to go to the gym, they can do all these before they work out. Put these in their warm up, okay? Um, all right, so first things first, prone T, I'm oh, sorry, a cobra. You're gonna squeeze your shoulder blades back and down, rotate your shoulders out, try to squeeze the bottom of your shoulder blades together, and then relax. And squeeze back and down, and relax. You're gonna do this 15 times, okay? Looks like this from behind. You're trying to squeeze the bottom of your shoulder blades together. Okay? If that's easy. Prone T, I also call the Brazilian Jesus. We don't, because we've all seen this, right? Okay, the difference is you're not going this way. His hands are like this. You're going like this, palms up, like you're trying to catch breathe. So, feet are hip width apart. You're gonna try to, you're gonna, it, it, you look like this. This is passive though. The difference is roll your shoulder blades back and down and hold them there. Brace here. Now squeeze back. This is a lot harder to do. It goes from being passive to very active. So without, I'm just doing this. I don't feel anything. Brace, roll back, squeeze. You'll see a difference. I'm not moving as much. I'm getting a lot more activation here. When that's easy, you go against gravity. So you hinge. So now I'm against gravity. Squeeze, like you're trying to bring your thumbs to the ceiling. You're not down here, that's a flying V. No V's, we're doing T's, okay? Gently guide your students' hands here. If they shrug, bring them down, okay? Because a lot of people don't understand how to do this, even kids. They need to come here, but they come here. They're so used to using these muscles, okay? Squeeze back and down, come out as a T. Okay, when that's easy or if the T's are too much, either way, we do something called a scarecrow. You're gonna push your hips back, roll your shoulders back, come up just like this. Why? I look like a scarecrow. I know it looks ridiculous, it's fine. So from the side, you're trying to bring the backs of your arms towards the ceiling, just like that. So notice I'm hinged, I'm not rounded. Roll the shoulders back, pull the belly button in, hinge, weight is on the heels, pull back just like that. If you're like this, you're not doing it correctly, okay? Those are the easiest ways I can tell you to do those exercises. So, we have, oh my gosh, so many more exercises I threw in here. Um, to be fair, I have a lot of these exercises on my YouTube channel. Unfortunately, YouTube is being a little weird and not letting me change my name, even though I've had it for, it's a long story. So, if you go to my website, www.musicstrong.com. Look at the little icons in the top and click on YouTube, Music Strong. Go to the, the click on the YouTube at top. You'll see a lot of those exercises listed. And I'll give you directions on how to do them because I don't have time today, unfortunately. I've also got some neck exercises, like not just the chin tuck, but the chin tuck and lift. Perfect if you've had a, a whiplash injury or any of that kind of thing going on. That's excellent for you to do. Um, if you, I get this question a lot, like, well, I don't, I don't uh, know how to find a good trainer. I don't know how to find, who do I find if I'm in pain? That's a loaded question. PAMA, the Performing Arts Medicine Association, has a great list of people, but they're, they don't have a comprehensive list. They don't have any personal trainers, which is kind of sad because there are good trainers and there are bad trainers. So. Personal trainers, their job, at least corrective exercise specialists, their job is to do what I do. Even if they don't know about musicians, they're gonna be able to find those muscle imbalances. So if you don't wanna work with me and I work remotely, if you don't wanna do that, find an NASM, not National Association of Schools of Music, but National Academy of Sports Medicine. Find one of them and a certified uh, CPT, who is also a CES, a corrective exercise specialist, and they will be able to help you out, especially if they are in your area, because you want somebody to guide you through that kind of stuff. Um, always Alexander Technique teachers, of course, Feldenkrais practitioners. Um, PTs are also a good option. So we get into a whole lot of different things. Um, I have a lot of different book recommendations 
I wrote a book last year called The Musician's Essential Exercises. And what it is, it's the basics of musician's fitness, the stuff you need to know to be able to go into the gym with confidence. I don't care if you're doing CrossFit or yoga or body, beach body, whatever. It doesn't matter what workout you want to do. These are the things that you have to know to incorporate into whatever workout you're doing to stay strong and healthy and have a great workout as a musician to prolong your career, okay? You can also use my stuff as its own workout. So that is the Musician's Essential Exercises. It's on my website. And right now, I'm doing a series of musician-specific instrumental workouts. I really hope you'll join me. And if you can't join it, because I know this is gonna be down the road uh, posted, but you can still access the recordings and they're all instrument-specific. I did oboe today, I'm doing flute next week. Um, I'm gonna be doing timpani and harp and audio engineer and trumpet and just about everything you can think of, okay? Hour and a half long for each. I think it's really great for every instrument to have their own workout because we have different muscle compensations for each. So I'm gone over time. I, I hope this has been beneficial. There's just so many things and I'm trying to distill it into the smallest amount possible. Hope this has been helpful for you. You can find me at my music, uh, my website at www.musicstrong.com. You can find me at Instagram and Facebook. Uh, go to the website and click on those little icons above, same thing. And send me an email, Angela at MusicStrong.com. I hope this has been beneficial. And don't be afraid to send your students into the weight room. It'll prolong their music career. Have a great day.